some some some. <laughs> Um, our daughter-in-law's sister, her name was Lisa Perkins, she had a mini stroke and oh. um, in the hospital. And I guess I'm afraid of also my, my sister's, my, my sister's daughter is actually flying to, um, I should have wrote it down, um, she's flying to China and then go to Cambodia and she's there for, so then once she's asked for journey versus for her, um, name's Melissa. I should know better. She wrote it down because I'm. But my wife's not here to remember that. But um, yeah, but also remember that too. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I've been on Chuck Baldwin. He's going to do interviews with our doctor now. Mm -hmm. He's still having trouble. He goes to work and becomes known for his right to fit and sleep all day. Mm -hmm. And don't know what's wrong. And I see the oncologist tomorrow. As Christians, we are to help wash others' people as, as, as you have washed us. And say, mercy, 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 mercy. There are more than 7 billion people in the world today. Although it's nearly impossible to calculate, we can estimate that fewer than 20% know Jesus as their Savior. As someone who knows Jesus, the staggering reality of the world's lostness reminds us of the importance of the Great Commission. But what can you, one person, do? Or what can your church, a single congregation, accomplish? The truth is, you can make a big difference through the cooperative program. CP is how Southern Baptists do missions, pooling the tithes and offerings from even the most humble incomes, and even the smallest churches, to reach around the world for Christ. Through the cooperative program, over 16,000 students at six SBC seminaries are being trained to preach and teach the gospel in churches at home and around the world. 10,000 new churches will be planted over the next 10 years in North America, in Canada, and over 20,000 Southern Baptist churches will experience revival and revitalization through our state conventions and the North American Mission Board. Southern Baptist disaster relief teams, fueled by the cooperative program, will continue to be first responders when trouble comes, at home and abroad. The face of Southern Baptist is changing, and through the cooperative program, Southern Baptist will continue to engage a growing community of ethnic, language, and African American cultures. Through the cooperative program, college students are confronted with the gospel on college campuses through collegiate ministry and Baptist campus ministry. Here's how the cooperative program works. It starts with you, giving yourself first to the Lord and then giving back to Him through your tithes and offerings. Your church sends a portion of those tithes and offerings to your state Baptist convention, 
which sends a percentage of its annual budget to the Southern Baptist Convention. The SBC then supports missions and ministries in North America and around the world. From seminaries to religious liberty, to disaster and hunger relief, to keeping more than 10,000 missionaries on the field. Because you give, because your local church gives, and because we cooperate as Southern Baptists, together we are fulfilling the Great Commission. The cooperative program, it begins with you and reaches into eternity.
There's so much power in a name, isn't there? Associations are made, and before long, one finds themselves stuck with a label, unable to free themselves from its ugly grip. Occupations oftentimes define a person and gives them their sense of worth. And so it was with me, Rahab, the prostitute. Tension was high in the city, as high as the walls that surrounded Jericho. There were wars, and there were rumors of wars. Everyone was on high alert. No one was allowed in the city, and no one was allowed out. You could almost see the city gates shake with fear. So when the two men asked me to hide them, it wasn't an unusual request. And when another knock came at my door, my heart began to race. For surely, it must be the king's men. There was much at stake in my life and my family's lives. So I sidestepped the truth and I told the guards that the men had already left. And it worked. The guards were gone, but the spies remained. Something burned deep inside me as I ran onto the rooftop. I knew what camp these men were. They were from the tribe of truth. And truth was what I so desperately needed. things in those days, but the most miraculous happened to me. Yes, it took courage for me to hide the spies, but it took more courage for me to finally cross over that line and believe in the one true God that I couldn't see, but that I knew was there. You see, we are all going to die. But how many of us will really live, live by faith? Many people judge a book 
by its cover. And many men have flipped through the pages of my story over and over again. And many thought that they knew how my story was going to end. Not so. For I am living proof that God is the only one who knows the beginning and the ending of every person's life. And just because a person's story starts out one way doesn't mean it has to end that way. Sometimes, our desperateness leads us to places that we don't want to go. And sometimes our desperateness leads us home, right where we belong. studying this week. If you've not taken out your bulletin insert yet, I encourage you to do that to, to fill in. Special thanks to uh, Jess and, and Bobby for the time that they spent this week uh, making some changes and cleaning up some stuff over here in the fellowship hall. Uh, as we mentioned at the last business meeting, we're going to start trying to go through the church a room at a time, and so they've tackled a few things there. If you have some dishes that uh, you had left behind, they're in those boxes underneath, or you can come and buy them at the, uh, the garage sale. <laughs> um, they will be moving on to other parts of the building, so if you really want those church bulletins from the 1970s that we have uh, Store downstairs, I suggest you get them and take them to the Smithsonian or wherever they belong uh, because they were, they're on the list. So, uh, anyway, thank you again, a special thank you. A couple of interesting things in the news this week. Uh, Saturday, uh, yes, Friday, Friday afternoon, talking about the Paris Accord and the headlines on Saturday. Now, if you don't know what the big deal is about uh, Paris Hilton riding around in a Honda Accord, then uh, apologies <laughs> to Jeff Foxworthy, uh, you might be a low information voter. Uh, something else happened this week. A, uh, you know, Jerry talked about forgiveness this morning, and we had a alleged comedian ask for forgiveness for something stupid she had done. And uh, I think if you look at it close, she was asking forgiveness from the people who pay her money to do whatever it is she does. Um, but after stepping in a big mess she created, she is suffering the consequences. Let's leave it at that. But I will say this, anyone who, anyone who thinks it's good to go after children and bully them as they're not quite right in the head. And uh, Baron Trump was a victim of that, and so were the Palin kids a few years ago. So let's remember that young lady in prayer. The Lord needs to do a work in her heart. She made a stupid mistake. And fortunately, most of the stupid mistakes that you and I made we're not on national TV and didn't cause headlines. We can be ashamed in silence <laughs> and obscurity. So let, let's remember, uh, let's remember her. She does need the Lord. If you have your Bible, we're looking at Joshua chapter 2. If you're using the Bible in front of you, it's page 158. We're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 2. The, that chapter to kind of give us a feedback. Now, 
just just so you know, I'm on a little bit early today, so we may get out a little bit early. It's uh, not that I have a lack of words, but uh, we'll see what happens. Joshua, chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim to, he said, go, go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. <coughs> but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly, you may catch, catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. Verse 7, so the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan, and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to, to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made with us, swear, will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father, your mother, and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you'll take this scripture. Help us to learn some things that we can apply to our lives. In your name we ask. Amen. Jerusalem, the city of God, sits at 3,000 feet above <coughs> sea level. If you travel north through the badlands of the Judean wilderness, just 20 miles, you'll come across Jericho. But to get there, you must descend almost 4,000 feet because Jericho sits at 825 feet below sea level, the lowest sitting city in the world. So from God's city in Jerusalem down to Jericho, it was a very steep grade, and Jericho was at the bottom. Watered by several large springs, the city of Palms is one of the oldest cultivated spots on earth with settlements dating back to 9,000 BC. And once you reach that city, you will find who we were introduced to this morning, Rahab the prostitute. The actual word in verse 1 identifies Rahab. The original word is a zonog translated 
a prostitute. But the word has a broader meaning. In fact, in the first century, Josephus, a historian, reports that she kept an inn. The consonants that compromise the word prostitute in Hebrew are the same consonants that compromise the Hebrew word for a female who gives food and provisions. The text seems to describe Rahab's profession as a matter of fact rather than negative, negatively as one might expect from a description of a prostitute. So the lifestyle of Rahab in the Bible continues to elude us. But seven <laughs> times she's referred to in the scripture and most of those times it's Rahab the prostitute. So remember uh, whether or not Rahab was a harlot or Rahab once was a harlot, or Rahab, who manages the local Red Roof Inn, we have Rahab this morning. Rahab learned the lesson. Now, there are people in our world that have not learned the lesson. I am not a product of my circumstances. I am a product of my decisions. Ben Carson was excoriated this week because he said, being poor is a state of mind. And you take someone who has money and take it all away from them and put them on the street, soon they'll be back up again. We've all seen people who have gotten great wealth through an inheritance or the lottery, and fairly soon they're broke again. Large percentage of professional football players are soon broke and in debt. In fact, Dave Ramsey says that NFL means not for long. They may, may, they may make big money for a while, but they won't make big money forever. There's a difference between being poor and being broke. Because poor is a state of mind. Broke is a lack of money in my pocket. But a person who has the state of mind that I, I'm, I'm in a bad spot right now, but I'm going to do something to get out of it, can do it. And, and Ben Carson Raised in Detroit by a mom who couldn't read or write. Work jobs was gone all the time. But she raised a pretty good young man there. Like his politics or not. The boy did all right. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. The young man did fine. Because he decided, I'm not a product. Just because I was raised in the inner city of Detroit. Just because I was raised in poverty in the projects. That is not going to hold me back. Rahab was a strong woman. She was not a product of her circumstances. Now, she recognized the political climate of the day and what was going on around her. She saw the situation there in Jericho. She had heard about what had happened with the Israelites and the Red Sea. She was up to speed with what was going on. And she trusted, she became a believer in the true and living Hebrew God. And she wanted to make sure her family was protected. Rahab's plan worked beautifully, and her faith saved the spies, herself and her family. She's mentioned seven times in Scripture, I mentioned before. And only one time did they leave off the harlot part. And that's in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, where they, it's revealed that she was the great-grandmother of King David. She was in the line. She was a relative of Jesus Christ himself. Gone from a harlot into the bloodline, the royal bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So do our past choices, circumstances, 
and confusion condemn us to a lifetime of cruel and captive consequences? Again, as I said before, we've all made mistakes. We, you know, I, I've made dumb of the, Dave Ramsey is, is fond of saying that he has got a PhD in D-U-M-B. He's made mistakes with zeros behind them. And all of us, to one degree or another, have done things that we regret that we would do different. But what can we do to break out of an unhappy past or a trapped mindset? Well, first thing we can do, your present choices, not previous circumstances, determine your future. Your present choices, not your previous circumstances, determine your future. Then versus now. I'm fond of an old Dutch saying that says, too soon old, too late smart. And all of us, no matter what the age, we can look back at our younger days and that just wasn't too bright. Our past versus our future. A while ago, I saw a humorous revision of the Prayer of Serenity, which originally had the three famous lines, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There's a new version called the Employee's Prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I cannot accept, and the wisdom to hide the evidence that I've been using the company property for personal uses, including circulating my resume, searching for a better job. <coughs> and Lord, please help me, help me be careful not to step on the toes as I step that, uh, on those. I'm going to read that. And Lord, please help me to be careful of the toes I step on as they may be connected to the rear I may have to kiss tomorrow. <laughs> and help me always to give 100% at work. 12% on Mondays, 23% on Tuesdays, 40% on Wednesdays, 20% on Thursdays, and 5% on Fridays. Amen. <laughs> We've all worked with people like that. Some people do not think change is an option even if they know what's good for them. Others change partially, or they fall short of change. Some change for the better, all at once, as in the case of Rahab. She made a complete change, a turnaround in her life. If Rahab was formerly a harlot, she had made a horrendous choice in her past. But it was a mistake of the past. Her past mistake was an error, but not the end of her usefulness. It was foolish, but not final. She could not undo the past, but she could reject the past and rewrite her future. She couldn't delete her deeds, but she could determine her future and decide her destiny. If the first half of her life was sinfully dirty, the second half could be spiritually clean. She was troubled, she was tainted, she was tormented, but she was not trapped. The two spies' use of her premises gave her permission and, and encouraged her to act. They didn't mean her any harm, nor did they coerce her to do something she didn't want to do. In fact, chances are good she didn't even really know they were spies and what was going on until all the king's horses and all the king's men showed up at her door to tell her what was going on. But I'm quite confident she was pretty sick and unhappy with her life, and she was willing to risk her neck and put her life on the line to change and to save her family. So Rahab made a wise choice for once and chose a better life for herself. The big leap was no more risky than a bitter trap in her life. Her actions proved that it was possible for the worst sinner to reform, shine, and triumph even in their darkest hour. 
Her background and her behavior countered against her, but she was determined to leave the past and its burdens behind. Her courage and change was a miracle. She must have wanted to leave the past so bad because her actions in hiding the spies was swift and quick, and it doesn't seem that it was premeditated. She must have pictured the day of her departure from her profession and orchestrated an escape in her mind many times before the occasion, but she was looking for an opportunity. Your present choices, not previous circumstances, determine your future. Tomorrow is past. You can decide today to make a decision and lead a new life. Now this is an old saying, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks more than your talk book talks. <laughs> I wrote it down because it's kind of hard to follow just hearing it out loud. It's a country western but, song. But, but when, you, when you look at it closely, it makes a lot of sense. So our second fill in, your personal comprehension not persuasive confession determines your future. Put another way, what you understand versus what you say, or what you believe versus what you do. A young man, an avid golfer, found himself with a few hours to spare, so he stopped by the local golf course, figured he'd get nine holes in before dinner, and as he about ready to tee off, an old timer walked up. Of course, the Rangers don't want people playing alone out there. They get as many as they can within reason to keep things moving. And so the old timer said, can I join? And he said, sure. And the old timer didn't hit the ball very far, but he hit it pretty good. And the young golfer found himself in a lay with a large pine tree in front of him. And he's looking at it, trying to figure out what to do. And the old timer says, well, when I was your age, I was in a similar situation with that very same tree. And I just hit it over the top. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the young man took a whack at it, up into the top of the tree, fell back down, boom, there it is right in front of him. Tried three times. Ball is still in front of him. He said to the old man, how did you get it over the tree? And the old man said, well, when I was your age, the tree was only about three feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> see, people see their circumstances in different situations. And it all doesn't apply to you like you think it should. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, <laughs> sorry, Rahab's change and transformation did not occur out of nowhere. She knew what she had heard, and she knew what she believed. Her understanding was thorough. It was unique. It was clear. And the way she said it showed that she had depth to her knowledge, and she had depth to this faith that she had in this God. When she was talking about to the, to the spies, she used three that's in Hebrew. That the Lord has given you the land, that your terror has fallen upon us, and that uh, all of the inhabitants are faint in the land because of you. Three facts that she knew about this Hebrew God. Now, she didn't know everything about the Hebrew God. If she would have been invited to a Bible study, she would have been a listener, not a helper. You don't have to know everything about the scripture to be able to share it and to be able to believe it in her heart. Now, I know we have some people who are mechanical in the congregation, but I can tell you this right now, and you know it for a fact, you don't have to understand the inner workings of a transmission got a license to drive that vehicle around town. The 
Amco says there's 800 parts in an automatic transmission. You don't have to understand any of those parts. You just have to understand what makes the car go. And so many people kind of hold back and say, well, I, I just don't know enough yet. But guess what? You're going to never know enough about everything to speak intelligently on every subject. Take what you do know and act on it. Ray have boldly claimed, exclaimed and proclaimed, the melting of hearts and the seas of terror. She knew, even though they lived in a walled city, that by some standards, people couldn't get through. They were scared to death. She, she spoke of them crossing the Red Sea. She spoke of them going on dry ground. Now, that's a miracle. That's a phenomenon that doesn't happen. But she understood it. She had heard about it. If the spies doubted what they just heard from her, they heard something even more extraordinary. She gave them a concise and positive historical and theological commentary how the Red Sea was dried up, brought Israel out of Egypt 40 years ago, uh, up to the recent destruction of the Amorite kings on the other side of Jordan. She was the one who introduced Joshua and into key Israelite history that the, the word dried up. The Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Joshua chapter 2, verse 10. Read it a few minutes ago. Later, Joshua incorporated that into his speech to the Hebrews in Joshua chapter 4, verse 23. And chapter 5, verse 1. This Gentile believer also boasted in Israel's departure from Egypt and removed the stigma of leaving Egypt. Previously, the phrase out of Egypt was not a name that somebody could be proud of. Israel thought that life was unbearable out of Egypt. Remember when they were complaining about the the lack of leeks and garlics, their breath had improved com considerably. <laughs> All they're thinking about is the stuff that gave them bad breath. Rahab even put Israel's last conquests before this spying episode into perspective. The victory over the two Amorite kings. So they were a feared and united army in the eyes of nations, these tent dwellers. What you do shows what you believe. You talk talks and you walk talks, but you walk talks more than you talk talks. Clem Blanchard says there's a difference between interest and commitment. When you are interested in doing something, you do it when it's convenient. When you are committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. We can all think back in our times in our lives when we, we wanted to do something or we thought it would be a good idea, but we didn't have the commitment to follow through. Remember my father wanted me to go to college for a year and get a little bit more of a biblical basis. He said, after you go for a year, do whatever you want. And so I went for a year, and I thought, well, this is okay. <laughs> I didn't know what else I was going to do. But then I decided, you know what? I started this thing. I'm going to finish this thing. I'm going to do what I have to do to finish this thing. Now, there may have been student loans available back in that day. I had no concept of that. Um, I did know how to work. And so I worked up to three jobs to work my way through college. And my second year, uh, I was married. Judy worked. And we got <coughs> in. I got out of college with a, a diploma and no debt because I was committed to finish what I had started. <clears throat> Your persistent commitment, not practical convenience, 
determines your future. Rahab paid her dues and she kept her word. Put it another way. Do what is right, not what is easy. Man went to the doctor after a few weeks of symptoms. Doctor examined him carefully and sent him out into the waiting room, called his wife in. She said, he said, your husband is suffering from a rare form of anemia. Without treatment, he'll be dead in a few weeks. Have you heard this? Don't stop me because I want to hear it again. Probably heard a variation of this. At least most of the guys have. The good news is, it can be treated with proper nutrition. You will need to get up early every morning, fix your husband a hot breakfast. Pancakes, bacon, and eggs, the works. You'll need a home-cooked lunch every day. It would be especially helpful if you could bake frequently. Cakes, pies, homemade bread, these things are that will allow your husband to live. One more thing, his immune system is weak, so it's important the home be kept spotless. Do you have any questions? No, I don't. So she joined her husband and doctor. What did the doctor say? What did the doctor say? The doctor said, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Rahab took things seriously. She knew the situation. Her commitment to her confession was ironclad. It was time-tested. It was history-bound. She was ready to break with the past and acknowledge the breakthrough confession. The Lord, He is God, that Moses had just barely taught to the new generation. A confession so new it was alien to the old generation. The altered version she espoused with the words, the Lord your God. Now, she wasn't distanc distancing herself. It's almost identical to what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 4. He said, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. When Judy and I sent our boys off to college, I sent them with some books. I've shared this before. Books that helped me a lot in my life. And I, I didn't want to get one of those Dear Dad letters. Mm -hmm. You know, your faith ain't relevant. I also didn't want to get one of those letters or postcard. No fun, no fun to your son. <laughs> so I sent them, a, sent them with several books and told them, I would give them a $50 bill if they provided me with a one-page synopsis of that book so that I know they read it. Now, I started in 96 when $50 was a lot of money. Because I didn't want them to say, Dad, your faith ain't relevant. See, I didn't want to send my boys to college with their faith in my God. I wanted to send them to college with their faith in their God. That way, if it didn't work, it was their problem. My God's still working. In fact, we've had a, uh, you know, our, our anniversary um, is uh, on the 19th, and a picture from uh, one of our wedding pictures, Judy has a bumper sticker on the back of her car, my God is not dead, sorry about yours. She acknowledged the Lord your God is in heaven. She acknowledged that God. At the end of her speech, she had acknowledged the God of Israel as Yahweh four times. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. The divine name foreign to unbelieving Gentiles. That was a name that Moses had given the children of Israel. And here's a, a Gentile that should not know these things, but she was well versed. She was a foreigner who had given one of the most stirring, dramatic, and outstanding conversion testimonies that we had ever heard. It's no wonder that the New Testament writers commended her for her faith. You know, she's the only woman 
that appears in the Hebrews Hall of Fame of Faith? You read Hebrews, the Hall of Fame of those great people of faith throughout the scripture. One woman in there, Rahab. Her invitation for her family to join her in her house until the Israelites returned showed that she meant business. She had a commitment. She had a stake. Her patient waiting was a testament to her seriousness of the cause. She was a woman with a reputation of the worst sort. But she had more commitment, more heart, and more determination than a lot of people you and I know today. She was not perfect. Nor was her livelihood exonerated, but she and her family were spared, rescued, and uprooted, and became part of a new nation and had a new God. Rahab's new life in the land had to change for the better because she worked hard to change her fortunes and lay the groundwork for a new life. The transplanted person, alien if you please, Subsequently married a man named Simon. They had a son by the name of Boaz. You remember Boaz and Ruth? She paid her dues and she reaped in common. Her son Boaz was a gentle kind and a trustworthy man. And though she is known as Rahab the harlot before, now she's known as the great grandmother of David ancestor of Jesus Christ himself. Have you made a clean break from your past? Have you known, accepted, and embraced God for yourself? To the young people out here, are you living in mama and daddy's faith? Guess what? It's going to fail. You need to have your faith in your God. Are you a witness to your friends, your neighbors? Are you concerned about getting your family in and keeping them safe into the household of faith? Has your faith made a difference in the lives of others? Have you withheld anything from God? Do you desire nothing but Him? Have you made a, no, a point of no return in your faith and commitment to the Lord? Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. I'm sure in a group this size, there are people who have struggled with their past. But you may also know someone who has struggled with or struggling with their past. If they're not here today, obviously, you can share this with them, but when uh, Mr. John sends out the link, send them the link and say, you know what, I heard this, it helped me a lot. Maybe it'll help you with your struggle. You know, there are many, many people out there that are struggling and they're just looking for a kind word. And sometimes you attract <coughs> people. I was in uh, Brooklyn yesterday on East Jeffrey Street, the 800 block. If you're familiar with Brooklyn, not a great place to be. Right around the <laughs> See someone shaking her head back there. And I'd stopped to, uh, to talk to somebody and I went to get back in my car and here's a guy that's got a big, giant bush. And he's got some clippers about this long. And I watched him for a few minutes. Now, the clock is my enemy, as it normally is. I've got some place I need to be. And I'm looking at this big old boy. And, and he, was, he was aggravated. He was just aggravated. And I happened to have a battery-operated hedge trimmer and a pair of uh, clippers in the back of my car. And so I got out, got my stuff, went over. I said, hey, buddy, you're killing me here. 
And I handed him the hedge clippers and I handed his buddy the other. So he just looked at me. But you know, it, in that block, usually you don't approach somebody unless you want something from them. <laughs> well, the size of this guy was no threat to him. But we chatted as he chopped back his bush. And he said, man, man, I, I really, really appreciate that. And I said, you know what? God is good. And I said, all I ask is that someday when you see somebody that needs a little bit of help, that you go out of your way to help them. That's all I'm looking for here. I had a chance to talk with him. I mean, it was the easy thing just to jump in the car and drive away, but it's almost like I felt one of these. You need to go over and talk to that guy. You need to go over and do something. When you're not expecting something, when someone reaches out to help, it's even more unexpected and appreciated and gets you thinking in the right direction. I hope our time together with talking about Rahab who had a very ugly stigma on her life. Even a label that had a bad connotation. But she overcame it because she had purpose in her heart. She wanted to do the right thing. And she turned to the right place to get it done. Let's all stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to learn something from Scripture. We pray that each and every one of us will look into our lives at something in our past that's dogging us. But Lord, we pray that we would have a heart of compassion when we run into someone who's just having a hard time from something that's dragging along behind them, that we'd be able to encourage them to do what needs to be done to move on with their lives. We'll ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing, Steph, you come.
yesterday we were here. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Before there are some churches that celebrate communion every day, some hourly on a regular basis throughout the day, 365 days a year. On the other end of that spectrum, there are churches who one time a year celebrate communion. The Bible just says, as often as you do. So there are different tra traditions with different groups. We do it the first Sunday of every month, because we do. <laughs> Trying to make it any more spiritual than that. The big thing we have to do is make sure that it just doesn't become common place. That it doesn't become one of those little rituals that we go through. We need to make sure that we comprehend what we're going through. The last night that Jesus, when he was betrayed, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Kevin, I'm going to ask you to return thanks on the bread. Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come to remember what you did for us so long ago. We thank you, Lord, for the obedient life that your son led, obedient even unto death, and that he did it for us so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Thank you, Lord, for the body that was broken for us. said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. After the same manner also, he took the cup. Brother Lee, if you would return thanks for the cup. Dear Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come around this table and to be served. Lord, we thank you for the symbolicness of this meeting of the cup, Lord, and the blood that you should now, your son Jesus Christ, to be shed for our sin. That is washed as white as the beam of snow. We just thank you for this opportunity and we give you thanks for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we're thankful for this memorial. We pray that we'll take it to heart and treat it with the reverence that it deserves. In your name we ask. Amen. Anybody here today? Anybody? It's a nice day, Kevin. Um, any announcements? Sounds okay, Craig? Yes. Um, Children's Choir will meet next Sunday morning. Okay. It's um, a little late for our first commitment, but um, actually, Grand Dollars, four seconds. <laughs> well, come on, yeah. Yeah, so, but, so we'll she do? She plays first. And it's Bible studies back on tomorrow night. Deacon's meeting next Saturday. Deacon's meeting next Saturday at the house. At the house, at the house. I'm behind you. Okay. Okay. Um, I found out last week that um, the youth who are going to camp, we've been assigned Team Orange. So um, I'm going to have a box put in the back next week, and I'll put a, uh, an email out oh, and orange. probably an announcement in the bulletin. Um, Anybody who would like to donate any orange paraphernalia for the youth to uh, show their team spirit while they're at camp, uh, we appreciate it. Do, or, do oil shirts count? Sure. <laughs> yeah, if you want to buy it, it's in the box. That's it.